So today we're joined by Timo, self-made millionaire, started a... Do you not like that title? No, that's fine. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. He started a business at 17, sold that for, well, 16 was it, and sold it at 17 for over a hundred thousand pounds, and yeah. then sold another business in your twenties for eight figures. Yeah. Also on the cover of Forbes 30 under 30, I saw recently as well. Yeah. My start question is, T, how does that make you feel? About your- <laughs> <laughs> I've got a counter question. How does it make you feel that you're the only guy here who can't grow a beard? Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> He's always coming at me about my hair, this guy. That was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. thanks for that. <laughs> so we both feel pretty inferior out here anyway. <laughs> Let's just start because... I've listened to a lot of you speaking yeah. and I love your honesty and transparency around money and your relationship and how that's changed over time. And we're going to get into that. Headline question. Do you think you're good with money? Do I think I'm good with money? I think if I had to give myself a rating out of 10, I'd say I'm a, I'm a 7.5. Yeah. I think I'm good at making money. I don't think I'm that good at like, growing money. Um, I think the last 12 months have actually shown me that like, those are two different skills and like making it and then growing it. And, um, I've had to go through a bit of a mindset shift basically from like, okay, like you need to learn the new skill of growing it because I still have some kind of conservative thoughts around money. That's really interesting because a lot of our guests here have said that, um, investing or making money isn't just for like rich people. They, yeah. they have a lot of clients who are really wealthy and they don't know how to make more money yeah. or like how to invest their money. They can make the money at the beginning, but yeah. then it's like, how do you grow it? How do you manage it once you have it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of those things though, where like the, how do I explain it? Like the time scales are different, right? So the idea that, all right, you know, put X amount into an index fund and, you know, it will grow whatever, 8% per year, blah, blah, blah. And then you go, yeah, but I could also just take that money and through my own skills, I could just make more money. And that wouldn't be 8% a year. That could be like 100% a year. And so that kind of like different time scales where you go from my input leads to a certain output to actually there's this vehicle that I can't really control and it will give me less kind of overall returns without me controlling it. I think that's where like the mental fuzziness comes. I've spoken to like so many of my friends who basically, you know, they've done well, they've sold their companies and they're like, cool, I'll put in whatever, like 500 grand into this index fund. And you know, I'd get another 50 grand. And then they go, yeah. Or I could just deploy this into a new business and that turn turns into like 5 million. And, da, 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 da. and so that kind of like mental fuzziness comes from just the change in time scales and i've realized that from so many of my friends and including myself that's why we lean towards the making of the money because we're so used to like our input equals some output that we can have some influence over versus actually you know like let's put into this and you know see what happens i relate to that so much and i've had to shift the other way in a sense because I come from a background of like I was a full-time employee my whole life mm. I would just put my money into index funds mm. then I started a business and now I'm mm. like hold on the return on my business is 300% a year mm. I need to invest into that and having that confidence almost yeah, yeah. one thing that I love about your story I think people focus on that eight-figure exit yeah. what I like about you the best is at like the age of 16 you started a business. Yeah, I'm fascinated about the decisions you made as a teenager because mm. as a teenager, I was obsessed with making money. I looked around me, I'm from a poor background like you and I, I wanted to make money, but I never had that confidence in myself mm. to, to do it, whereas you did. What in your life made you think at that point, I can take that step, I can take that action? Um, good question. So I think it came down to two things. One was naivety. <laughs> and the other, which a lot of people don't talk about, but I'm going to say it, is I think I had a bit of a superiority complex. So it's a great answer. Naivety, because, you know, at 16, 17, you don't know what you don't know. So you just assume like things will be easy because they look easy, right? It's like, well, of course, if I do this and this and this, <laughs> and then that'd be it. Superiority complex, because I think that, especially at that age, I kind of had this, not so much a chip on my shoulder, but I had this self-image of 
myself that like I was smarter than most people. I could learn faster than most people. I mean, part of it came from the fact that I was pretty good academically. So it kind of introduced me to this sense of like, I can be better. I am better. And so when I had that sense of a superiority complex, it was like, well, you know, other people can't do a business at this age. I'm going to be that different person. Other people can't do this. I'm going to be that different person. So it was a healthy dose of, well, I don't know what could go wrong, right? Because I haven't experienced that. And also nothing could actually go wrong mm. because I'm just better than most people, yeah. right? And it's interesting. Most people most of the entrepreneurs that I speak to, they wouldn't say it because it sounds very egotistical, but it's not meant to be like an egotistical thing. It's more kind of this self-belief that you have in yourself that like, it doesn't matter if someone else has not done it, I can do it. And so that's what I mean by naivety and also a bit of a superiority complex. That's a youth thing as well, isn't it? Like, yeah, you know, my son thinks he's bulletproof, right? Yeah. <laughs> and as we get older, we, we learn how fragile we are and yeah. we become cautious. And I think starting young allows yeah. you to have that like naivety. One thing about listening to your journey at 17 it was clear to me that you were kind of stumbling through this business. You, you had no idea what was going on. And, no clue. Yeah. But that was like, that was so inspirational because I, it's like with investing, right? I talk about investing in a lot. Just start and mm. figure it out and get going and like yeah, improve yeah. your life that way and give yourself more other options. And with your business, it was like, they just said, oh, do you want to sell it? And you were like, oh. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, yeah, most of the people, man, like most of the people who you see who have done something significant started off not knowing what the heck they were doing. And then after the fact, it seemed as if everything was laid out, but that's only after the fact, right? I'm actually currently um, listening to an audiobook of LeBron James. And turns out the guy was playing like college football. Like yeah, he, yeah. he played American football. Yeah, that's crazy. And at no point until further down the line, did he then go, oh, I want to be a basketball player, right? And you go, well, surely someone like him knew from the time he was five years yeah. old, he knew this was what it was going to be. But he also just like stumbled and stumbled and stumbled. Um, and that kind of story, that kind of narrative is something that you see from like pretty much most people. And I think that was definitely my case. That was definitely my story. Yeah, I think success in business in life maybe just comes to who jumps the most hurdles and like yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. stop jumping and it's yeah. this attitude of i will conquer these things and i think your story your background armed you with that your dad your yeah. like your where you were born and stuff can you just expand on that a little bit and like how did you did your upbringing kind of shape that attitude into you yeah i mean so i I was born here, but then I grew up in Ghana, lived in Ghana for 10 years. And then I came here in year six. Um, and I think even just that, like, you know, earlier I spoke about this whole idea of having a superiority complex. Mm. I think the thing, and if you have listeners who have experienced kind of having education in Africa, you tend to have learned the stuff like two years earlier. So the stuff we're learning in year six here, I had learned like two years so before. So the education's almost a, a further ahead. Yeah, yeah. Really? It's like okay. it's like way further ahead. Wow. Um, again, it kind of goes back to the thing that we spoke about before the podcast, which is that education and some people would be so would be so much further in life if they just had a different location, mm. right? So in Ghana, the stuff we learned was way, way, way earlier, and so. I'd come in year six, they'd be asking certain questions. And I just know the answers to those questions just because I'd learned it before. And then that created this sense of like me I'm being- smarter. Yeah, yeah, me being smarter when maybe at that time it was just, I had just learned the stuff yeah. earlier. And so that, that then added a bit more of that self-belief. So, you know, I'd, I'd grown up in Ghana, 10 years, came here in year six and- I lived with my dad, right? And I lived with my dad, like fourth floor council estate in Oaken Road. And there was this sense of, you know, everything is fine. Everything is chill. Um, going to school, I went to a school called like City of London. Uh, uh, well, is it still called an academy? Yeah, I guess it is now. Uh, City of London Academy. Um, 
and you know was just a school in Southwark and then I just was going for sixth form and for sixth form I then went to a private boarding school called Christ Hospital the only reason I was able to get in was because my grades were good <laughs> and so I got a scholarship to Christ Hospital like everyone there was just just so many geniuses you name dropped a kid who like oh uh, yeah this luke stevens yeah, yeah, luke. luke stevens um <laughs> never luke forget Steve can't forget luke stevens <laughs> because i do remember when i first encountered luke and thinking i I'm thought dumb. people <laughs> like you were fake right <laughs> like you are so intelligent dude was like 16 and doing uh double further maths and getting a hundred percent in it and i was like okay this is the level right and um realizing that i was like okay i can't win the intelligence game my maybe there's a different game i can win which is the business game because all you guys are optimizing to get into oxbridge but i'm optimizing for like wealth right and so i then really like focus on that business game so i think those are just like different points of my upbringing um which changed the way that i thought about wealth and money and probably the third one was like kind of I didn't realize how to explain it. So growing up until probably about 16, I didn't realize I was poor, if mm. you know what I mean, right? Because like I grew up Oakland Road, council estate, like everyone around me like was poor. Yeah. So I didn't realize I was poor, right? Um, and then going to boarding school, I was then like, oh, like I'm poor, right? <laughs> and and there are levels to wealth that were completely different to what I thought it was, right? Like there are levels which are not you're either poor or you're Richard Branson. It's actually there are a bunch of different tiers in that which which you can aspire to, and kind of combined with that, um, I then like stumbled across this blog, which has gone defunct now. And I was actually looking to buy the blog, um, but the founder just didn't reply. <laughs> but it's a blog called um, Retire 21. I bet he's got it that he missed that email. Yeah, <laughs> um, like, and I remember just reading stories of people, of young people who had built companies uh, before they were 30, you know, there were uh, articles about a guy called Pete Cashmore, who was the founder of um, Mashable, um, all of these. And I just thought, man, like, this is, cool. this is so crazy to me. And so kind of those three instances, I think, coming from Ghana and like having this sense of, oh, okay, I, I can learn things faster, which again, could have just been a consequence of the fact that I just learned them earlier. Um, going to Christ Hospital and going, right, okay, this is a completely different academic level. Like, I thought I was smart. You guys are geniuses. I'm going to play a completely different game. And then also just being there and going, oh, okay, right. Um, there are levels to wealth that I didn't know about. I think those three really changed my how, perspective. How did you, like, well, it's around 16. How did you stay motivated? Because I know 16... Me and Dan, we both wanted to make a bit of money. I was I had businesses which weren't quite as successful as yours. But I mean, I started when I was a teenager, you know, coming from Nigeria on holiday, mm. coming back, bringing back loads of cigarettes, selling, <laughs> <laughs> selling them to all my classmates for like 10, 10 times the price. And then uh, I had a few other small companies. But like most 16 year olds, I was more interested in like basketball, girls, partying. Um, how did you stay just focused on just work and like just focusing on business and starting a company. And when it was successful, hadn't you just go, I've made it now, I'm gonna go party and like yeah, celebrate. That's what, <laughs> most, yeah, how are you not dead, exactly. Most teenagers um, making a lot of money, they're gonna blow it and funny. have a good time. Um, by the way, the cigarettes hustle is crazy. That's the first crazy. time I've heard it. Really? That's the first time I've heard really? it. 10, pa know, ten packs of cigarettes in Nigeria were like five pounds. And that's then obviously crazy. here it's like 12 pounds a pack. This no, is not a, This is not investment advice, by the way. I don't think you can way. really do that anymore. I don't think you can. No, yeah, it, it was different times. It was different advice. times. This is not financial advice. Yeah, or business see, plan. Yeah, uh, that's funny. <laughs> um, how do I get motivated? Man, do you know what? So there's this, there's this kind of framework. And I think I heard it from... Tony Robbins or something like that, where he said like, you're either pushed away from something or you're pulled towards something. And I think at that age, um, I was like just pushed away from the circumstances I was in. Like it was like every day, cause I lived on like the like fourth floor of a council estate and like no lift, right? So every time I'd go up, 
I just keep telling myself like, I don't belong here. I'm better than this. I don't belong here. I'm better than this. And I think, again, combined with that kind of feeling of superiority, definitely added to that. Um, and then to answer the question about like, why am I not dead yet? <laughs> um, so I think, look, like when I sold the prior company, I think it was such a, it felt to me like I had discovered magic. And I think that I've said that before, uh, that it felt to me, you know, I'd started something and then 11 months afterwards, someone offered me 110 grand. And I was a 17 year old who like didn't really understand money. Hmm. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I have like figured out a hack. That's actually how I felt. It was Facebook think, pages, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Facebook pages. And I thought, wow, I figured out a hack. And then I think, after I sold Entrepreneur Express, when I came to realize, oh, the value, because um, for your listeners, what Entrepreneur Express was, was like an online business publication. But the thing that I did well was I was able to grow it by creating really big viral um, Facebook pages. And I will distribute content from those, uh, from my blog, and I will post it into the Facebook pages. And that will drive hundreds of thousands of people to the website. And it was just after I sold it to this company called Horizon Media, I was then like, oh, I thought they were buying the blog, but actually they were buying the Facebook pages because that's where the audience was. That's where the distribution was. And so when I kind of internalized that, I think that was a big factor as to why I then didn't um, kind of feel content because I felt like, oh man, if I knew that was the thing of value, value in my yeah, yeah, like it was there. Yeah. And sure, it's great to have this money, but there's a lot more you to do done, here, yeah. right? So I think that kind of uh, shifted the way that I thought about it, combined with that and also combined with like the idea that I thought this was magic, um, that I could think about something, I could put in effort, I could put in the inputs, and then the output would just be more money than I thought was possible. I saw like, this is the game I'm going to just dedicate my life to. And um, to be honest, that was kind of part of the, uh, part of the drive behind um, fan bites was also always like, mm, okay, this is a fun game. Let's put in the inputs, the team, the investors, the idea, the market, and let's see what outputs can come from it. We talked about dying i mean I, <laughs> uh, you know people people spend money in different ways but i think one thing that's worth pointing out is you did run through the money quite quickly you? <laughs> you, 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 you might not have spent it on debauchery but you you had you threw some up the wall yeah i um the first bit of cash i made i didn't feel like i was worthy of the cash and i think mentally so you know i i gave some to like family and stuff but really i like squandered most of it so i i, I spent about 40 grand or so of that 110 grand i i spent it on um spread betting um oh, my kind of just, guy <laughs> <laughs> i like your style just, just like that like high risk lose it all yeah, yeah. Like a, little bit, a little bit risk averse i'm not if, nah, if, high um, risk all the way what is this so i'm 28 now so it was 11 years ago like if i'd known about crypto <sighs> i'd have probably have just like but then again maybe i just you know spend all on bitcoin and then who knows right yeah you'd be doing pretty yeah <laughs> um so um yeah so i squandered that um spent it on a bunch of things that i thought could make money but did you invest in effort i mean you say spend on things that could make money did you no nah, man you know i'm trying no like at that time i was so convinced that it was like a skill i was beginning to hone that's another question when people make apple they make yeah. like a big company what makes you think you can do it again so you did your first company you raised yeah, yeah, yeah. you sold it yeah. what made you think okay i can do this again i can do this again i, I found a cheat code like most you people didn't be feel like, like you got lucky you yeah felt like validated a lot of people are like wow this is this is my big shot i made it yeah i'm done now i don't want to risk it again let me just invest this money but you're like i'll spend the money and i'll do it again what gave you that confidence well so i think Spending the money or rather squandering the money, right? Didn't actually come from, I could do this again. It came from just like me wanting to make money fast. Yeah. So like spending 40 grand in spread betting because 
you see people doing well in spread betting is not like sensible right <laughs> it's just it's just oh let me see how fast i can double this right yeah. because i thought that because i'd done well in um in like business that therefore translates to every other way of yeah. making money which was you know so stupid um i do think that the thing that made me then think well i can do this again is i do think that i had especially when it came to the whole social media game i felt like i was in the game quite early and so because of that i thought well we haven't maximized this opportunity yet and so that was a big reason why i then thought do you know what like there is more uh juice, juice to squeeze yeah, yeah, yeah juice. <laughs> ah, see, exactly so that was that was my mindset there. it's almost a ban up uh, a good thing that they they didn't rip you off, but they didn't really yeah. convey the value. And yeah, you yeah. probably felt a bit shortchanged. Yeah, exactly. That made you go again. Whereas if you'd have got true value, you might have been like, right, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and then blown it all and maybe not gone at it again. You spoke about levels and yeah. there's points in your life. I'm poor. There was a point in your life where you saw a mate get picked up in a helicopter. And yeah. made, you were like, oh my God, there's another level. Jonathan, yeah. Yeah. Now you have millions. Yeah. Where do you feel that you're at in terms of levels? <laughs> um... Good question. Um, so I think I've actually been on a bit of a roller coaster, right? And this is something I spoke to another friend who's who sold his company recently. Um, well, no, actually, for about like two years ago, so about a year before mine. And he said something super interesting. He said that. After the first three months, when the money kind of drops, you kind of feel like you feel like it's not real. Mm. And then you go into a feeling of just feeling so just invisible. Like, oh my God, like I am the guy. I can do no wrong. <laughs> Everything just comes to me. And then you go into a feeling of a bit of fear. That you'll lose it. That you lose it. And I think that I went into that fear mode pretty early. I think I got into that feeling of, oh, I don't want to spend this. I don't want to do this. So much so that I actively had to kind of journal to myself and tell myself that actually I was capable of um, getting it again. In fact, I remember once when I felt kind of really fearful i used to journal to myself oh like if it all goes at least i can get a good job as like a chief marketing officer it's somewhere. Crazy, isn't it? which is so outlandish it's like you have mo like millions and millions of like more money than you need in your entire life and then you go well at least you know someone could hire i do that all the time about my youtube channel if my YouTube channel yeah. deletes itself, well, I could I could be a consultant or I could get a job yeah, again. And yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's not going anywhere. Yeah, though. it's Chill it's, out. it's it's um, and I think it comes from having from like growing up without much. Yeah, then you just feel that. Damo, do you know what one of the common traits is for really successful people? Really nice teeth. I do have really nice teeth, thank you. But it's actually reading. To be fair, I watched this thing the other day on Bill Gates and he was saying he reads, you know, like 10 books a month or something like that, something ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, they say like reading is the cheat code for life. The super cheat code is Blinkist. It's great, isn't it? It's pretty awesome. They condense the books down into these 15 minute audio clips that are just really easy to consume to get all the key information from the book. Yeah, I knocked out a couple. Uh, Millionaire Success Habits and uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Did you like them? They were pretty good, they were pretty good. I mean, Bill Gates wastes like hours reading these books. I just knocked it out in 15 minutes, so unlucky Bill. Unlucky Bill. <laughs> if you wanna be like T um, and not like Bill Gates, then you can sign up to Blinkist using the link in the description. It's really easy to do. It, you get a better deal through us as well. So you get seven days free and 45% off your first year. It's blinkist.com forward slash making money. That's B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com forward slash making money. T. Now, back to the show. When you sure. see someone like Mike Tyson or like yeah. all these celebrities, they make millions half and millions, a billion half spent, a billion, yeah. and then they have a big on. Do you have a big entourage? You have tigers I and stuff. You got tigers. Yeah. I um, and then somehow they go bankrupt, and yeah. you're like, every normal person is like, 
if they gave me a million, I could stretch that for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, so how do you lose like hundreds of millions or 50 yeah, yeah, million? Yeah, yeah. So how, where does the fear come from? Wouldn't you be like, even if I go crazy this year and I spend yeah, five yeah, mil, yeah, yeah. I've still got like 50 yeah, million. Yeah, still, yeah, yeah. Like worst case scenario, put a mil in, 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 under your garden. Yeah, 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 and yeah. then you're like, okay, if everything goes wrong, I've still got a million. So yeah. where does the fear come from that? What's your like biggest expense? Like how can you blow all your money? That, where does that fear come from? I think my biggest fear at that time, um, not not um, anymore now, but I think my biggest fear came from the fact that it still didn't feel real. So I have a spreadsheet and I would like track my um, net worth. Like, just goes, dunk. <laughs> <laughs> like one more yeah. Yeah. And I track my net worth like every week for, mm. for a while, for like six months after the acquisition. I like track and... I would be so kind of annoyed if, you know, by that time I'd put money in stocks, indexes, you know, I, I done a bunch of different things and I'd be so annoyed if like it went down by like five grand a week. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Right? <laughs> I'm like, like my whole weekend is ruined, right? And it's like, dude, you have like millions of that. Like, what is wrong with you, right? And I think it's because the numbers didn't actually feel real. Like yeah. they just look like numbers on a spreadsheet. And at some point you would, um, yeah, you'd feel some way. So actually, this isn't something that I've ever shared before. Um, I went to my bank and like, cause I had to internalize this. I went to my bank and basically, <laughs> and basically like for a week, I just keep going and keep going there to the point where by the Friday, I had taken out 400 grand in cash. And I just looked at the 400 so grand. See it in right. physical, physical yeah. cash. And then the next week I then went and I took another 400 grand in cash. And then next week I then took 200 grand. And I just said, okay, this is a million pounds in cash. I did that with tenors. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> but I did that because I was like, pound in cash. I was like, so All right, visualize like it. Timo, this is real. Like yeah. you made that, you did that. Like this is it, okay? Made it so, physical rather yes, than numbers on a screen. Exactly, because that transferring from like um, numbers on a screen, which constantly made me feel fearful of, like, okay, what if that number's zero? Yeah. And I just like, oh my God, right? Yeah. And now it's like, no, the number can't be zero. Cause like, this is physically what it is. Um, one day I'll do that again. But it'd be 10 million. Well, well, I could have taken it. Anyway. <laughs> humble brag. Humble. I love the humble flexes on the show, right? Like, he's always flexing, but now you're just coming out. You've out flexed him so much. You can't, you can't flex anymore, David. Whatever. Uh, Talk about a sip. <laughs> you got 10 million on the floor, mate. You're Rolling talking about a sip. On the sip. Um, oh, no. But yeah. And you know, that was a big shift, which then enabled me to like actually be fine. And we spoke about me um, going to Bali, right? Like that was a big shift for me to go, okay, it's fine for you to, you know, spend like 25 grand first class flights to Bali, get the best hotels, get the best thing. Because actually, if you're looking at a million in cash, like actually 25 yeah. grand is just like this part of yeah. it. And I went, oh, okay. How long did you go fine. to Bali for? Uh, two weeks. Yeah, I went for like a week and I didn't spend 25 grand. <laughs> I, I partied like a rock star. Yeah, so but you also what did you do? Like first class Who flights. did you buy? <laughs> what, did you, what, did you, what did you do out in Bali to- You uh, a small village Even, out even there the now. first class flight is not going to rack up to 25 grand. So what, how, well, how Emirates, much- yeah. Emirates. Oh. Emirates be expensive, you know? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, Emirates, have... first class flight for two. Uh, um, and then like the- Resorts. We stayed in the best resorts. I had a like full time driver. Um, like the meals were great. The hotels were great. Like everything that we possibly could do was great. Um, in fact, even uh, in three weeks, I'm then doing my next big trip. I'm going to the Serengeti. That's like oh. thirty grand, I think. So like, like getting used to the feeling of okay, like spending money, but. You know, Serengeti with like wild lions and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have life insurance? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have life insurance, but I should have life insurance. You probably should. <laughs> so my world manager keeps telling me about life insurance and I keep saying, okay, I'll do it, yeah. And and, and all he needs are some, you know what, you reminded me. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, my, my fees are 10%, so, so, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a kind of transition basically from, from, from like being quite fearful to then 
being a bit more open with it, which um, a lot of people I found, especially if they come from a, a similar background, just they just go through that. Um, then the other thing, um, I know I've been going on about this particular um, question for a while, but the other thing was like normalizing. <clears throat> so if say I was on level eight, level of wealth, normalizing people who are level nine and 10. So I sold my company for tens of millions. I then forced myself to hang out people who sold the company for hundreds of millions. And to them, like spending 30 grand on a flight is like, all oh, right, it's cool. Like we're thinking about taking our private jet yeah. to Levels. Antigua. And it just made me kind of go, okay, cool. This is great. This is amazing. Where you are is great. But also if you believe you're the type of person who can build more money and build more wealth, then like naturally it will follow that like, this is the next step. So normalize that rather than being fearful of that. And so that was a big kind of mindset shift as well that I made. How you, you taught, one of the things you did, the strategy was get a million quid in cash. <laughs> How do you now manage this money? You know, like a lot of people listening to this are on their own personal finance journey. Yeah. And they manage their finances. I think it'd be really interesting to hear how someone with yeah. a million quid in cash in their house, not anymore, I'm saying. Yeah, no, you no, But like, how do you manage it day to day? Um, so I, so I've created a bit of like a barbell strategy, which is really, um, you know, with the help of my, uh, financial advisors and stuff where, you know, you have your, uh, conservative, then you have, well, I guess you have your low risk, medium risk, high risk, um, right? So my low risk is like cash, which is in money markets earning some percent. I think mine's earning like, uh, three percent or so um so that's um got a few quid in it and then in the medium term uh, i then have my indexes my uh any stuff i do around like commercial property stuff and then in the high risk is like investing um i.e angel investing i do a bunch of stuff where i would like I'll be the founding investor in yeah. a bunch of other companies. So perhaps like that would be less of, you know, 10K, 20K, more like 100K, 150K. I own whatever, 40% of the business. The other guy runs the business. So it's, so it's, so it's pretty much like a barbell strategy on one end cash index funds. Well, yeah, like, yeah, I guess like cash and, and index funds. Medium is like stocks blah, blah, blah. And then the more high risk stuff is where I'm taking a bit more of a bet on myself and my judgment and my, you know, business sense. Would that high end, that last section be kind of your entrepreneurial side? Exactly. So, like, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. instead of you being fully running the business and growing it, yeah, you yeah, yeah. gave me your input and- Yeah, yeah, you yeah. no appetite to- do it again, like what? with family, like set Start up a, a business. New business. Would you rather? Oh, yeah, yeah. Would you rather invest? No, 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 no. I'm too young to be just an angel yeah. investor. Um, <laughs> I will start another company. In fact, um, fun fact, very fun fact. What's today's date? The fourth of May. Of May. Ah, so exactly one year ago was when we sold the company. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Exactly um, uh, that. So, so your your new new wealth, really. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You yeah. call it me new money. <laughs> You're like, look at you, new I money. I have no money, mate. <laughs> so, it's okay. Uh, yeah, twelve exactly. months. Exactly. Yeah. Are you happier? Yes. Like, you're, you're happier. Yeah, yeah. But what I would say is as well that give me money, I could spend it for a year. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I will find new things to buy. Yeah. But fast forward five years, yeah. do you feel, do you, would you be living the same way you are now? And do you still think you're going to be happier as a result of the money? So, you know, this whole kind of, does money make you happy thing, yeah. right? I thought about it a lot. And I think, um, and I actually don't think it's kind of a uh, either or. Like, it's not, does money make you happy? Because I don't think that it makes you happy if you're sad, mm. but I think it makes you happier. So it's like on a spectrum, right? So I think if you are, if you look at, you know, from zero to 10, 10 is like ultimate bliss. If you are a four in 
happiness. Having more money will make you, like, generally, it should make you a six, yeah. right? Or if you're a three, it should make you a five. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you are happy. It just means you are happier because you have less problems, yeah. right? And so that's kind of the way that I see it. So I would say, while I was running Fanbyte, I was always... So I actually think a big shift, a big shift, actually that happened was you know fanbyte we started in 2017 and it basically was basically, so we built software and services to help brands to run influencer campaigns specifically targeted at gen z and we saw it in 2022 right in our third year we came up with a compensation plan which basically within our third year yeah, in 2020 in our Third year, we came up with a compensation plan, which is basically like our base salary. But then um, we're able to then take a percentage of like net um, profits per quarter. And that was really interesting because there were some months where we'd make a million a month and that would just increase our salaries like crazy because we have a base and a bonus. And I think that, feeling of actually just again through our efforts being able to just like scale our income kind of not really tied to just the length of time we'd been working i think that like got me used to having more money and or just like over time having more money which therefore meant by the time that the exit happened i was probably maybe i was probably maybe like a seven out of 10 happy and then by the time it, it happened i'm now like a 8.5 yeah out of 10 rather than almost like okay throughout the whole company we had no money we're yeah. like constructing and then i was a four and then i became an 8.5 yeah. no i think i was journey. already happy you got to ramp up a bit yeah, yeah right but i do agree with some people where like i do understand when some people go you know we were grinding, we didn't have no money. And then suddenly we got this big deal and then we were like suddenly like incredibly happy, right? That I think has worked, but that is not um, what I've heard in my case. So how how would you think that the money's changed your life then that, that makes you happier beyond material mm. success, like being able to buy holidays? You find you're less stressed? I find them, ah, oh man, that's a good question. I think that I think the biggest thing for me, so how it's made me happier, obviously one is being able to like take care of family and stuff. Um, I have, but that's the thing, like most of the financial concerns of family had kind of been sorted like beforehand. Um, but, you know, now, you know, I had a family member who is quite close to me say they had a bit of debt that was going on. I said, okay, cool, I I'll take care of that. So that was pretty, that was pretty good. Um, I would say that I feel a bit more, I'd say that I feel a bit more stress, but the, but I think the stress doesn't come directly from the money itself. I think the stress comes from the way that the way that I made the money. So what I mean by that is like because we made our money, I and my co-founders kind of like made a money from business. And because we were also quite young, there is this sense of, all right, like now let's go do it again. And the stress comes from now almost trying to like trying to almost get into a business or start a business which can beat the previous yeah, exit. Yeah, you, got, you, got, you set the bar pretty yeah. high. So it's like, so like that's why magic stressful. in the bottle yeah. again. Yeah. But actually, if you're honest with yourself, if you just started another business from nothing and sold it for a million quid, that's pretty good. Exactly. You know? But would you feel as good? Because, yes. Would you be like, no. oh, because I did it again? Or would you be like, I need to sell it for more than I saw yeah. the last one? So I think I would actually be like, that's the internal battle that I face. Yeah. Because to then... If you started another business or if I started another company and that, you know, got sold for like a million, that would mean that basically like 
three businesses in a row I have built and sold. Like mm. that is kind of like yeah, it's a good hit. That's yeah. Yeah. that's a good hit rate, right? Yeah. That's a hundred percent hit rate, right? <laughs> But I'd still feel like, oh man. I took a step back because yeah. it's not as big. Yeah. But everyone else would be like, wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, exactly. So, internal discussion. So that's something which I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and again, they wouldn't say it because they'll be like, you know, it's all about the journey and all that shit, right? Um, <laughs> and it is all about journey, but also like we all have an internal scorecard that we use to gauge um, whether we are doing well or not whether we are actually like falling behind our potential or not. And I think that is something I've had to internally wrestle with, which is it is fine for you to have your own scorecard, which is not a comparative scorecard. I've hang out with three weeks ago, I hang out with someone who sold his company for 200 million. And I said, like, Oh my God, this is so amazing, etc." And he said, yeah, but insert next person here. So there's for a billion. It's like, really, bro? Really? <laughs> you own 80% of this business, which means you walk away with 160 million and, and you're, you're, still comparing and you're stressed, yeah. you know? And I, and I can imagine there is someone who maybe has sold their company for like 5 million, who's probably listening to this conversation and going, bro, if I sold my company for tens of millions like you, I would not be thinking about it. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's just this like perpetual bullshit hamster wheel. Do you find, um, and I do you think find that's most like yourself and other millionaires, do you find that when they make their money, they work harder or they work? Obviously you might take like three months off, go travel. Yeah, go yeah. Have fun, but do you find like now you're back to your routine? Yeah, yeah. Do you work harder now or do you, do you work harder on the way up? Like, are you more ambitious now or were you more ambitious then? I think, I actually think that so actually i don't think ambition is the same as working harder right so i think we tend to be more ambitious now but we work less harder you work smarter <laughs> yeah. yeah so we work much smarter okay. i was actually talking to a friend of mine about this and he said that second time or third time entrepreneurs they don't lead by their passion they actually lead by what the market wants. Yeah. So um, they go, okay, um, I've seen a report which says that there is a growing trend in dietitians or something like that, right? Um, therefore, I'm going to, and I know there are 200,000 dietitians in the UK who need this sort of tool. I'm going to build something to help that. They don't, they're not passionate about yeah. dietitians, right? Yeah. Um, but they are passionate about the business opportunities. So I think that is a trend I see, which is they are less emotionally involved. They're much more Practical objective. And, objective, and yeah. I think, to be honest, that was the way that I treated Fanbytes. I treated it very much as like, you know, objectively, this is an interesting business. This is a business that is going to consolidate at some point. Therefore, let's get into this market because in five, six years, there's going to be consolidation. Therefore, go, right? Rather than I'm really passionate about yeah. social media, you know, because I don't know, like I'm passionate about a lot of things, but I don't <laughs> build businesses around all of them, you know? Yeah. I, I just want to come back to your point around yeah. this constant adjustment, this like hedonic treadmill yeah, that yeah, you're yeah. on. I can empathize a lot through YouTube because what YouTube mm. gives me is like 24 seven. I can imagine, stats. yeah. Every video is like ranked. The stats are live. Yeah. I yeah. remember when I first got a thousand views on a video and I, I was like made up. Now if I don't get 30,000 views within 24 hours. You're like, damn. I, yeah, I'm ready yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to delete my channel. Like, <laughs> honestly, I, I, and my missus is like, 30,000 people. Yeah, it's like yeah, a stadium. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I look at someone like Ali Abdul, who I know is yeah, 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 yeah. If he doesn't get 200,000, he's, he's like, oh man. Yeah, exactly. I've been looking a lot at, you know, how to reset these like, yeah, these yeah, things, yeah. these practices and how to kind of like strip away that. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How are you going to deal with, with that in your life? So I think the way I've actually dealt with that. So there was a book I read, which completely changed the way that I thought about this. It's by a guy called um, Dan Sullivan. It's called... um. The gap versus the gain. Right. Completely changed. Because the whole idea was, you know, um, people either live in the gap or the gain, right? The gap is where they are versus where they think that it should be. And the gain is actually where they were to where they are now. And you have to like mentally constantly tell yourself that actually look where I came from. Yeah. And look where I am now. 
because the truth is like there would always be someone doing like better than you in some facade right like there will always be someone who is better looking than you. There will be someone who is in the better shape Not than you. you. I was gonna say <laughs> both, of them, both of them are me versus you. Yeah. Better uh, looking, better shape. You you? Taller. Yeah. Oh, okay. Taller than you. Taller than you. Taller than you. His hair, mate. Uh, like, he uh, combs it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there will always be someone basically who do that, and so you have to almost internalize where you came from. Um, you know. Going back to the point about money, this is actually something that I had to internalize a lot. Like, even after the acquisition, I was still very fearful about money. And I had to, again, you know, I mentioned the 1 million in cash thing. But the other thing was also like, I had to almost, <laughs> um, I, would, I would write out literal examples of, of, um, times would show that I could make the money back if I lost something, right? So let's say, you know, uh, right, I look at my spreadsheet and it shows that my index funds are down by or whatever, 10 grand. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I, I literally get a journal and I'd write, okay, well, you know, even though I'm down by 10, actually I have a speaking engagement that's going to pay me like 20. Okay, cool. I'm the sort of person who can like earn that much. Okay, cool. And I'll like just constantly internalize that because I had to give myself like a mental makeover. I think a lot of people, whether you are entrepreneurial, um, whether you work anywhere, is like you have to give yourself enough mental evidence to say that 100%. you're the type of person who can make more money, right? It's like your like imposter you have, syndrome. You've got to like shout, put a mirror yeah, in front of it and go, yeah. look, look at it. Like, mm -hmm. like you actively have to talk, because think about it, right? Like every belief you have about yourself is basically due to some kind of like past experience that you've had, right? So if you just like remind yourself of all the positive experiences and all the things that confirm the type of person that you want to be, eventually you'd like brainwash yourself basically right like you do it enough days you brainwash you say, do you do it every yourself. day or yeah, do you, yeah i so had i had a moment i did this. that yeah i had a moment just like this recently where i've i'm earlier in the journey of like coming to terms with the fact that i'm capable than you are mm. like so what you're saying really resonates with me because i really struggle with like imposter syndrome and mm. this feeling that like what I make isn't good enough. Mm. Because with a YouTube channel, what you essentially do is you sit in a room all day, you make videos and you throw them out there and then that's it. Like there's, yeah. no, there's no real feedback, there's yeah, no people. Yeah, yeah. And it culminated in like two days ago, I was sat in 10 Downing Street speaking to Rishi Sunak. And that's at that cool. moment I was like, I got here from my spare bedroom yeah, with a laptop. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like through sheer force of will of just battering away at a keyboard. And now I'm here speaking to this yeah, bloke. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah face up to it, Damien, yeah, that you're actually yeah, okay yeah. at this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you, like you're you, that guy. You're capable, yeah. yeah. You're that guy. Have, have um, like, this is something that I said um, to my friend Joe. I said, like, you basically have to have undeniable proof that you're that guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I'm so, still not quite sure I'm that guy, but. <laughs> no, you're that guy. Like, no, you're, him. You're, uh, him. Fundament, you're him. You're him. You're right? right? like, him. Like, like, capital H. Like, capital H. Capital H. H. Like, fundamentally through your efforts your skills your um your mindset you have created a life and a day where someone said we want damien to come in here mm. and it's like yeah here i am and that's something which like regardless of whether you're entrepreneurial whether you work in a company like regardless of that if you almost you know some people say they're not good with money i go well that's just bullshit right yeah. because it's not that you're not good with money. And it's also not that you're bad with money. Like you just haven't built enough experiences to say that you are someone who's like comfortable with money. So you just need to like build enough small steps to say, oh, okay, like I'm good with money. I'm good at this. I'm good at that. Alex Hamozzi talks about that. I don't know if you know who he is. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. But he says about like the unrefutable evidence. Yeah. Like being able to say like, I've done this. I've done it multiple times, which means the trend is that I will continue to do that. Yeah, Whereas yeah. people along their journey are going, all of this was luck, all of this was yeah, yeah, They yeah. rationalize it all the way. Well, it's like, well, actually, the likelihood is you will continue to be what yeah, you have been. Yeah, you know? exactly. So you would build another business if you wanted to. Yeah. Like that framework, I think, I think that he may have got that from a, a guy called um, Jim Rohn. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And like Jim Rohn basically talks about this, just, you know, like 
you say that you're about the money. Okay. Like first step, open up an ISA. Mm. Okay, cool. Next step, make sure that you, you know, contribute to your pension. Okay, cool. Right. And then you maybe add a few other um, things into that. Like make sure that you set up even whatever, 500 pounds a month, 200 pounds a month, 100 pounds a month into like an ongoing um, index fund. Cool. Suddenly you are like better than 80% yeah, of people. Yeah, you're, you're the 1%. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Suddenly yeah. you're in the 1%. And then you now tell yourself, oh my God, I'm in the 1% of something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then suddenly you're like, well, it just so happens that after just doing these three things, I am now good with money. And then you walk around and live your life like someone who's good, good with, with money. money yeah. And you start like seeing the world as a game. You're like, you know, yes, I've got an index fund that pays me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, I've got this that pays me. Yeah. I've got some, some, some. I'm that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that guy, right? Like, right? And so it's kind of like taking those small steps, regardless of the 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 kind of level of wealth that you have. I think it's just like hugely transformative to you. I think um, I w there's a there's a moment like I was listening to you talk on podcasts, and there's a there's a defining moment in your life where I think that could have really shaped you one way, and you used it in this way to kind of be like you drove through, and that's with your father. Yeah, if you don't mind me talking about yeah, go ahead. it. Your father passed away when you were 20s. My father passed away when I was 13. So I related yeah. a lot to what you said. And it, it defined my life as well. Maybe we'll go into that in a second for the positive. But you you said like, because of what he said to me before he died, yeah. I knew that the business I, would yeah. be a success. I drove yeah. that business on the basis that it was for him. Yeah. It was like, it was all mentality. And that's kind of crazy in relation to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, like, before my dad passed, so he, so he'd had a first like stroke, and then he had a second stroke, which unfortunately was a fatal one. And I do remember that um, when, so you know, typical African dad doesn't really understand what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so this was like very early on in the journey of fan bites. Um and he didn't quite understand what we're doing, but like it seemed to be going well. I think we'd had a first newspaper article in like the Daily Mail and, you know, he understood the Daily Mail. Right? Yeah. It was like, you know, my son and his friend are in the Daily Mail and it's not for something bad. Right? <laughs> and so he was like, you know, I don't know what it is that you're doing, but I just want to say that I'm like, I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of who you're becoming and I'm just really proud that whatever you do, it will be something that is remarkable, right? And, you know, probably about a few days afterwards, just randomly, like I went into his room and I found that he died. And I just thought, oh my God. Like first I was just in obviously shock and I was crying, etc. And then just a few days afterwards, I just remembered that That's conversation. Good, yeah. And I just thought, right, okay, all right. Now it's game on, right? Now it's game on even on top of the game on, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, because the fact that he had said that to me made me feel like, oh, this has to be a success. And so I actually said this to Ambrose when we sold the company. Um, Ambrose was my co-founder. And I said, it's kind of funny, like there was never a point in the journey of fanbytes that I didn't think we'd sell the company. There was, there was never any doubts because I just couldn't see a world where that happened. A really interesting story. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever said it before, but a really interesting story. So when my dad passed away, I just, I just went ham. Like I just kept working and working and working. And I was emailing clients, trying to get more brands on, et cetera. And it just so happened that we got on a brand called Tunemoji. Tunemoji doesn't exist anymore, but we got on that brand and that brand was basically like a mobile messaging app and we got them on and they paid us 20 grand. And at that point, that was the biggest deal that we'd ever got. And I always go back to that because I always think, like me getting Tunemoji on was about three weeks after my dad passed away. 
And that there was such a pivotal customer because A, it was our biggest deal. We're able to use that as great case studies and it landed us our biggest investor. And it just further proved to me about how I use that particular moment of my dad passing to just almost channel this sense of like, this has to win, right? We have to win because we're not just doing this for ourselves, but we're doing this for like a bigger purpose than us. And so, yeah, I think that was a really pivotal part, uh, both personally, but also professionally as well. So when, so my dad, and I didn't really know my dad. He wasn't a great dad. I don't really blame him for it because he, my mom got pregnant when he was 25 and he just bolted because he was mm. scared. Whatever. Like fast forward to when I was 25 and I got a girl pregnant mm. and, and I was scared, right? But like to the day we were the same age, exact same situation. That's crazy. And I, I just didn't leave because I wanted to run. Like if I'm being honest, I was scared. I mm. thought I thought I was too young. You know, this is why I don't blame my dad because I know the mindset he was mm. in. Um, so I didn't leave. And that decision to not leave, all my friends went to Australia. I was going to go traveling. I just stayed behind, buckled down, started mm. working, mm. did what you did. I went ham because... There was something there that mattered then. Yeah. It was my son. I wasn't going to let him down. That's I was going to be a better dad than mine was to me. And through that, that's all led to here. It's like this serendipity. That's interesting, yeah. You know, like yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about. Yeah. I like to believe that I'm in control of my life. But there's always yeah. these certain points where you're like, always that's random. crazy. Yeah. Like, that, that's led to here. And yeah. But you did control how you reacted to it. Because a lot of people I know have lost their yeah. parents. They go the completely opposite direction. Yeah, and, you yeah, know, yeah. Start, yeah. Your, your mindset is like your thing. Like your ability to like, just push through those things. And I think everyone deals with loss. Everyone yeah. will. Not everyone deals yeah. with it young, but flipping it and seeing it, not as a positive, but seeing it as something that you can channel, like you say, I think is a super powerful message. And like yeah. that anyone sitting at home thinking like, this part of my situation is bad. Well, actually that could be the thing that leads to yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the fan bites <laughs> yeah. blowing up, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, there's a phrase I, I saw, which is like, we are the stories that we tell ourselves, right? Yeah. So you can decide whatever story you tell yourself. Um, that would be true. Yeah. So you're like, yeah, and it'd be true. I'm too tired to go to work today. You'll be too tired. You're like, yeah. oh, I feel tired, but I know I can get through it. You're yeah. going to get through it. So whatever you think becomes your reality. Yeah. Um, and again, like if we're kind of uh, bringing it like to the money conversation, it's like, well, you are whatever you tell yourself about money. Right? Yeah. Like, I listened to the first interview that you guys did and and Claire, Claire, Barrett. Claire I yeah. think. Yeah, Claire Barrett. And, and she had people like the uh, spreadsheet slave. The, yeah, the Spendy mind. Wendy yeah. over here. <laughs> Spendy <laughs> Wendy. Right? Or S Spendy Spencer. Yeah, Because right? I'm a guy. Uh, yeah, Spendy <laughs> Spencer. <laughs> um, and I remember, and I think one of you asked the question, like, do you think it's possible for you to you change? Know, change. And she said, yeah, right? And, and... When she said that, I was like, this is amazing. This is great. And there are so many people who don't believe it's possible to change. Yeah. Like they just believe, well, here I am. And so here I am, you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, actually you could just reinvent your story, you yeah. know? And the, I think that's all fascinating. The birth of my son's like a massive event, but at that moment I just went, I'm different now. Yeah. Like, and I wasn't, I was the yeah, exact same yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. the hot yeah. mess that yeah. like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> before that I was just in loads of debt and that, but at that moment, because of that catalyst, I said, yeah, no, yeah, this, yeah, everything yeah, is different yeah, yeah. now. Every, yeah. I am a different person. I am good yeah. money. I started in, invest in all these yeah, things yeah, and yeah. that's propelled me to here. So like you say, it's, yeah. it's a label that we apply to ourselves. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. What I want to talk about now is some practical advice for people. Yeah. Because I think a lot, there's a fact, 79% of Americans think more money will, will make them happier, right? I think a lot of people think that people with money have all the answers. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, do you think that's the case? So I think one of the things that I did, I think this was, you know, getting towards the end of Fanbyte and I've done a lot more now. You know, people would always say things like, uh, time is money and and I think oh yeah okay mate right <laughs> but I do think that the more money you have the more you're able to think in terms of leverage and mm. being able to leverage other people's time and that doesn't necessarily mean that you know you now need to go and pay um 
like pay a full-time person but you know like in fanbytes our first ever employee was also our longest serving employee was actually a guy called alfred and alfred is based in the philippines and he has worked at fanbytes the whole time and he didn't cost that much but what i start to realize is like as you get more income you place a higher value in your time and you should start thinking about how you can apply leverage to your time and so one thing could be and i think like people think it's only f like for the rich but i think you know things like using virtual assistants to do tasks which you know maybe five dollars ten dollars which can save you a bunch of thinking time is something which i think most people if they if they if they're in a good job um they could really leverage to 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 make more thinking time for themselves my my missus runs a business um like a small business and it's very like time intensive she, she it's like piece rate right so she tattoos eyebrows on on, on women oh, that's cool yeah it's like permanent makeup tattoos eyebrows yeah yeah, yeah like oh, yeah, semi-permanent cool. so like that she can color the lips do the eyebrows oh. so older women when they're the hair's thinning she can make it it looks, oh, it looks that's very incredible it looks make like it look hair. like you're wearing lipstick all the time yeah like, it, that's it, incredible it looks like hair yeah but but the the, 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 li amazing. the limit to her business is she can only earn when she performs because when she, she performs, yeah. yeah. But then what she was struggling to scale out of that. And what she did was hired someone in the Philippines who's five dollars an hour. Yeah. And all they do is they reply to every social media message, everything, and her client base has just gone boom. Because gone crazy, yeah. she was like, if I'm not tattooing, I'm not earning. So I can't be replying yeah. to every like or comment. Now this Filipino woman at a cost of fifty dollars a week, yeah, replies Insane. anyone who likes just goes, Oh. Do you like the picture? The picture. Do you do you do you want yeah, to hear yeah, about yeah. my services? Yeah, and she just gets so much more business off yeah. that. And yeah, like you say, it's it's thinking like, what in my life do I put off or don't do that? Yeah. Actually, if I outsourced at a low cost, yeah, would, that, yeah. would that improve? Yeah, I think leverage is the most important, and then the next thing is just ruthless prioritization. That's just that's just one thing that I've noticed and I've learned and I've started to introduce myself and i think again it's something which i think is easier as you have more means but it's not something that is exclusive to people who have more means and by that i mean like really focus on the big rocks like really focus on the on the on the things that move the needle rather than the things that like feel nice to do. Definitely the wealthier you get, the more it's almost you're forced to do it. Yeah. All right. But it's like an action and a behavior trait that I think regardless of what income you are, you can start to introduce and it can work really well. I also think it's something that that never gets easy. So like yeah. I, I have to say no to things. And the things I have to say no to just keep getting bigger. Yeah. You know, yeah, and that, that gets yeah, hard when someone's funny. like, will yeah. you do this for X yeah, amount? Yeah. And, you know, I think, no, my time needs to be spent making videos. Yeah. Because anything that isn't that is diverting me away. Yeah. But then someone will go, I'll come do this for a grand. Yeah. And I'm like, no. And then like six months later, it's come do the same thing for 10 grand. Yeah. And I've got to be like, yeah, yeah. oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it gets it's it, a saying no like that and prioritizing yeah. your time is a, is a skill that you continually have to up. Almost. Yeah. And it's because, you know, for so many of us, and I had to, again, like mentally reframe this, we think that like activity equals output, mm. right? So because of that, we are in love with being active and being busy where naturally you go, well, most of the activity you do is kind of bullshit, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, and yeah. so those two things are things that I see that like really drive people and can really help you to almost, you know, uh, uh, have the mentality of the wealthy without at that point having the income. Well, most people who aren't wealthy working in an organization is using them as leverage. Yes. Essentially. The, yeah. the, the people at the top. Um, I was having a conversation with another creator the other day about this podcast. And they were like, why don't you just do it yourself so you could own the whole thing? Yeah. And what they didn't understand was like, there's a load of people sat behind you yeah, right now that they yeah. can't see. But I would rather own a percentage of something with, yeah. the, with the combined effort of five, six people than yeah. me own 100% of it and just it no, go nowhere. Yeah, because yeah, I know yeah. that the people behind you are all talented and 
that yeah. I'm using them as leverage essentially yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. to, to, to build it. So I 100%, 100% agree. 100%, 100%. But yeah, it is interesting that most people think, oh, that's just for the rich when actually they're in an environment where they're being used as leverage yeah. to, to expand a business. And it's yeah. maybe asking, how can I do that in my own life? Yeah. It's something they just have to... It's something that you have to like unlearn, i.e. That, that there are things which are just reserved for the rich. Um, and then it's something that you have to learn, which is what are those things and how can I do that regardless of my income? Yeah. Definitely. So yeah. you have to both unlearn and then learn new things. Is there anything that you're trying to unlearn now? <laughs> um, but you completed it. <laughs> no, no, no. Completed no. money. <laughs> no. I am trying to unlearn. Well, okay. I am trying to unlearn the desire to have a relative scorecard. So I am trying to unlearn the desire to like, to always go for the next big thing and the mm. next big thing and the next big thing. Um, I think part of it is also, I have no brothers and sisters. And so I have always kind of tried to compete with someone the world yeah yeah the world right and um i think that conversation that i had in my friend who you know sold for 200 million and was like comparing himself to a billion and i was just like Ugh. Mm. like that made me feel sick i was just like Ugh. Mm. like you worked for i think his company was like 12 years i was like you work for that long and you now have you know 160 million like, that's insane. You're not satisfied. Yeah. You're not satisfied. Yeah. So, I, and I remember saying to myself, like, I'm not a religious person, but please God, do not let me be this guy. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think that's definitely something that I'm trying to unlearn. And then actually, in regard to money, I'm trying to unlearn this. And I think I've got there, but it still needs more um, training um, to detach my sense of worth to how much money I have. I fucking struggle. That's hard though, when everyone's like, you're the eighth figure yeah, guy. Yeah, like the yeah. world puts that label oh on you. Oh my God. Like, Forbes is like a, how rich yeah, is this yeah, person magazine? Yeah. Like I was, your, yeah, your so identity different. is that. That, 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 that was, that was difficult. That is difficult. It just is something I need to be able to detach from. I think actually, do you know what? Like probably about, six months inside yeah i'm trying to think uh, probably till october because my birthday is on like the 8th of october so last year probably like a month before my birthday i think that was when it was like really bad where in fact fun story um the day after we <laughs> the day after we saw the company you know like i just well, I went to bed, I woke up the next day and I went to the gym. Um, and then after I'd gone to gym, I then went to Sainsbury's. And I just felt this like crazy dissonance where I just sold my company. I'd become like a, I, I'd become a multi-billionaire and like the world was just going on as normal. Mm. And I had this just craving to be like, guys, yeah, guys, shut, look shut. what's happened. Look at it, right? I had that last night with Rishi Sunak. I was walking around South yeah. Penn just going, look at like, like talk, guys, talk, talk come to me about on. what's just like, happened. Ask me how my day is going. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll how my day is going. So say, how are you? I will tell you how it's going, mate, right? I will tell you how it's going. Fucking great. Right? Uh, <laughs> and, and like, I had to just detach from that. And the funny thing is, I thought that was just me. But my friend who has also been through this, he said he had the same thing. Like the next day he went to Tesco and he just felt compelled to just be like, all right, everyone is this aisle, I'm going to buy all your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. He was just like that. And like, he had to go through, he actually had to have a therapist actually to like detach himself from it because it's got to a stage where he had spent you know 10 years of his life building this company it was all that he'd ever known people knew him as that guy that guy that guy right um and that's something that i think i've begun to unravel and i think again this doesn't just apply to like being an entrepreneur i think there are 
a lot of people who work in certain companies where their entire um, uh, brand and their sense of self is like ex-Googler. It's like, okay, that's me. I work at Google. That's it. Everything you talk about is, well, at Google, we do this. Well, mm. And it's like, okay, we get it. But like, what else are you, right? What other interests do you have? And that is a kind of, again, a mental challenge struggle that I think everyone needs to go through. How do I detach my sense of self from my profession, my job, my past achievements? Like, who are you when all those things are taken out? Especially when you build a business, like with my YouTube channel, I got interviewed the other day and someone was like, what do you do outside of YouTube? And I was like, and you're like, nothing. no, no, yeah. There's nothing. Like I used to like this, I used to like that, but all that's gone. And it's like, my, I am my channel. Like, exactly. it's crazy. Like, to- YouTube, I can imagine is even worse, right? Because it's like, it's like, you are the product as yeah. well. Like your right, life yeah. is yeah. Yeah, intersects there's with no your- exit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, the, yeah, you can't just, yeah. I can't, I can't sell it. Yeah. 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 The benefit of a YouTube channel is it, it continues to run. So I don't get to exit, but I get to stop and it exactly. will run for a few years. Exactly. Die off. I guess that's like semi-exit, but it's separating me and my life from the performance of my channel. Yeah. Because at the minute it's, if I post a video that's bad, it ruins my day yeah. and I need that to stop. Because that's yeah. that's just work. Do you know yeah, what I mean? like and it, it, the it's so hard to do up. that. It's mm. so hard to do that. You just have to almost like force yourself to have like different hobbies. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like uh, force and, yourself, and maybe get to a point where like y- you've you've reached a level of success where you can say, oh, actually, it was worth it. Yeah, because there's always this thing in my head of like, have I thrown away my job that was a mm. hundred grand a year, really steady, and mm. one day I would have been a sales director and I would have earned good money. Mm to pursue making videos in my spare room. Whereas now it's getting to a point where it's like, actually there was, it was a good decision. You yeah, know, there you, was a reason for you've it. You've earned enough money. And the one thing that I've really been leaning on is the impact for people. Yeah. And that, that has helped me go, this is a bigger thing than just you and your net worth. Which yeah, is like, yeah, yeah, I talk yeah. about money, so money's clearly important. Yeah, to me. yeah, yeah. But the, just having people reach out and go, I've started investing. I've invested for my kids. Yeah. yeah, and that's maybe what you need to yeah, yeah. do where you're not a guy that's made a load of money. You're a guy that's really good at building businesses. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the money is a byproduct of that. And, yeah. and I think what you can do in a relatable way is share that the money isn't everything. Yeah, yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? It doesn't like fix everything. It might oh, 100%. Bit, yeah. yeah. And I think funny enough, like that is the, that is the, detachment that I'm coming to or that you know slash that I've come to which is um if you assume there would always be a bigger goal then actually like don't build your identity around the money because it will always move right yeah it always either get bigger smaller blah, blah blah but actually based off the past things which is okay I understand how to build businesses and as a consequence of that, I can then um, help other people build businesses. I can then help people achieve their dreams, achieve the thing like through building businesses. And so that's kind of the new identity. And, and also like, you know, I'm a fun person to be around. I do fun things. I have great friends, you know, just like, again, brainwash it yourself. Like, yeah. Yeah. I look a- after my family. For me, it's like, exactly. I'm, I'm a good father. Like well, these things are like things that help me detach from yeah. the thing, the, because YouTube is an ever moving thing. Yeah. I, between me and Mr. Beast, there's a lot of steps. Yeah. Right? yeah, like, yeah, and, yeah. and it's impossible to ever get, with my kind of content, I can't get 100 million views. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, so yeah, that's true. am I going to compare to that guy? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, so <laughs> maybe let's end on the question then. What, what are you going to do next? Well, in regards to like this money topic, I think definitely, I feel like a, kid again when learning about um growing money and investing money and kind of all of that because as i mentioned you know we saw the company 12 months ago and i helped as part of the transition like to make things uh smoother etc but now i have a bit more of like mental capacity to learn new things so i think one is definitely, you know, spending time almost like a kid learning a new set of skills, which is around like growing money and investing and all of that. Um, I mean, fun fact, throughout the whole time, <laughs> throughout the whole time uh, that I ran Fanbyte, I didn't set up a pension. 
sixteen percent of self-employed people have a pension. The rest, yeah, don't. I know, yeah. yeah. Because we all have, you're all in, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we all have this belief, like it's going oh, back into the business. Yeah. It's fine. It's going back to the business, it and exactly. then, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but anyway, like it works for you. Yeah. You know. So I can't be going too wrong if I'm following your steps. Uh, <laughs> just, just like seven years behind that's him or something. Excuse, <laughs> that's his excuse. That's his excuse. I saved nothing because I'm going to exit. And so um, spending more time doing that, this is is uh, pretty exciting. That's amazing, mate. If there was someone right at the start of their journey now, and you were going to give them one piece of advice about, you know. I know you, you were a moment in time and your circumstances are unique and you can't replicate that easily, mm. but what would you say to someone like how, getting started? As in someone who wants to do entrepreneurial things? Yeah, just start a business okay. and or build something for themselves in terms of their wealth. I think that's that's your skill set and that's where we should focus. Uh, okay. Um, there's a lot, but I give one, which is... Um, don't think you need to come up with an original idea. Your first business was just a copy of like yeah. other blogs you liked, wasn't it, basically? Every single business I've had has not been original. Even Fanbytes, the whole game of like connecting brands and influencers, I just saw that somewhere else. And I then said, right, we're going to focus it on the Gen Z audience. That's it. So I think if you're starting on, you almost need to figure out like, what are people already spending money on and how can I take that same model and apply it to a different audience, a different niche? And then tied to that, I would say lower the expectation for your first ever business. Um, if you look generally at like my past experiences, like the first ever thing that I started was at 14. And then at 17, I built Entrepreneur Express and that sold. And then at fan, and then at 21, I built um, Fanbytes and that sold. And it sounds like, like a really clean story. But like in the middle of that, probably like eight different business ideas that I tried, which just flopped. Like you don't hear about them. Yeah. And so I think people go, well, if my first business is not the multi-million one, then I failed. Mm -hmm. When actually I just go, well, if you started, the odds are, it's probably going to flop, but you learn a bunch of stuff, which would make it even better for the second time. And that second time, you'll probably flop, but less. And then by like business number four, you're like, oh yeah, now I know all these things, right? <laughs> so those would be two things. Like number one, pick something, like don't feel the need to come up with an original idea. And then number two, lower the barrier to success because the odds are your first thing isn't going to do that well, but if you just consistently learn and iterate and you kind of lower the pressure on yourself, you end up being a faster success than you thought you would be. You're a legend, Timo. Thank you so much for the Thanks. chat today, mate. Really appreciate it. Himo. Himo. He is him. He is him. He is him. That was good. That was good. That was enjoyable, man.